Hello and welcome. My name is Evgeny Rusakov and you're watching TVP World interview from Vilnius. A while ago, Vilnius held a big conference that was called Defending Baltics. Loads of relevant topics were raised during this conference, but the main late motive of this conference was about the Baltic states and our ability to defend ourselves. To discuss this conference, we are joined by one of its organizers, a representative at Locked and Loaded Civic Center for Security and Defense Analysis, Mantas Vilimas. Hello, Mantas, and thank you for joining us today. Hello, my pleasure. So, uh, Mante, uh, one of the topics during the conference was about resilient Europe and shaping its defense amidst uh, new threats. So, is Europe really ready to defend itself with, on, our, on our own? As we all know, European nations have neglected their defense and military capabilities for years and years. And only after Russia's aggression against Georgia, against Ukraine, only after authoritarian regimes demanded NATO come back to its 1997 borders, European, big European nations started to wake up to, to, to realize that, that our security is in our interests for foremost. Uh, to this day, it would be unwise to assume that European nations are ready. Uh, yes, we are waking up, we are preparing uh, Western is countries. Is this a quick wake up or is this a... No, it's a very slow one. A very, a slow, very one. slow one and gradual one as we can all see that we have a lot of problems in decision-making processes and, and our political will is wavering from topic to topic. Um, this is good to, good to see that something is happening. It's good to see that uh, the reality of urgency of m security matters are already on minds of many Europeans and European nation leaders. But we're not there yet and we need to continue to strengthen up. By the way, you as an organizer of this conference, you definitely spoke to many of guests from, from Western Europe, from, from different countries. Uh, behind the scenes. What would you say about their position towards what's happening right now in Europe? Because from, from my perspective, the West is not really thinking the way we here in, in Eastern Europe, are, uh, Eastern NATO's flank things. Of course, that's most definitely the case. And the closer to the aggressor border are you located, the more you're awake to the dangers uh, it possesses. That's, I believe it's only natural and uh, as we, as we see from the guests, from their uh, opinions, from the realities they bring from home, that uh, Western countries are already, I don't know how to even call it, uh, forgetting that, that there is an imminent danger here. And maybe North America is far from the well, front. It is. Geographically, it is. Well, let's, let's from one sign, yes. And, let's be honest. But it's, the bigger problem is that it's far in their minds, which it, which it shouldn't be. Because, you know, NATO is cross-continental union that's, that has a lot of border with, with aggressive nations. Um, but at least in Europe, uh, we have we have understanding that uh, that the security matters are urgent and they need to be explored, and and we need to prepare to to get ready for any inevitable any scenario. Any conflict? Yes. Okay, I see. Uh, so, okay, you've mentioned NATO. And there's my next question. How can European and NATO <coughs> political and military leaders ensure sustained commitment to defense investments and readiness? It's simply by continuing what we are doing and trying to find a way to minimize the political inability to, to, to make strong position. We, we need unity, we need political will, uh, we need less fragmentation in implementing that will in, on every step, uh, not only uh, on trying to find the best strat strategies, but to implement those also. We already have two years of ongoing discussions and talks of what should be done and when should it be done. But still talks. Still talks, but then again, at least, well, it's two years later, but we still, have, we finally see uh, heavy weaponry in Ukraine, we see fighter jets in Ukraine, we see 
more and more something, red something lines. Something is moving. Something yes, is moving. more and more of imaginary red lines uh, drawn by Putin is is being crossed, and that's a good thing. And that's what that that's exactly the thing that European leaders should understand that. Uh, the only countermeasure against uh, a bully. regime and against the bully and is against a bullying is not declaration of war. This is declaration of actions. That's sure. Uh, okay. So, uh, what improvements then uh, should be made on NATO and national level, especially small states like Lithuania? Well, we need to continue to invest in our military capabilities, uh, both in firepower and maneuver. We need to adapt new technologies. Uh, of course, drone technologies are a big player in the battlefield, battlefield today. And as we can see, it's one of the most cost-effective cost options. Uh, you can bring firepower to, to, to the battlefront. Um, we need to continue to build our political support for every decision making. Uh, we need to continue to to find unison in in our well union. Uh, as we all know, we have some nations like Hungary that is pretty we have, ambivalent of we where have. they stand, where they stand, and what they want to do. We don't know how. Uh, the USA. What would be their next step and all that stuff. Yeah, what what the what the next president is going to be and how the foreign policy of the United States is going to change. But besides that, uh, we need to understand once again that our security is first and foremost our responsibility, and it doesn't matter who sits in the White House or who sits in Budapest. We still need to look for the ways to strengthen strengthen ourselves up. Nice words. Hopefully, some nice words will become some nice deeds. One we day. hope so. Okay, NGOs. Uh, what role did uh, non-governmental organization <coughs> uh, organizations? play in supporting both the civilian population and uh, military operations in Ukraine? Well, it is understandable that military and governments are unable to fulfill all the roles in the wartime scenarios. And as we see in Ukraine right now, or as we are building up our resources, is under assumption that NGOs are a vital part of uh, supporting uh, nations functions during a wartime, uh, the help of various uh, simply logistical needs or uh, food, water, helping the most vulnerable, vulnerable parts of society. Uh, they need to be integrated a lot and there needs to be cooperation between military fields and NGOs, governments. Everybody should actually, in my opinion, Everybody, military, NGOs, uh, and government should train as one, act as one, and look how to cooperate in various scenarios. Okay, but then there's a question about those NGOs. Uh, that mean that literally means that by letting NGOs to cooperate more with military and with governments, uh, this is this looks like a very very sweet piece for third countries for our enemies to open their own NGO and to get some vital, some vulnerable information? Or am I, am I wrong here? Well... <laughs> you, you correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm, I'm not really, uh, I, I'm not always aware of how NGOs work. So this is, this, is where, this is where you come on stage and tell me that I am wrong. Of course, the adversaries are looking for ways uh, in, inside uh, military or governmental functions in every sphere they can get their fingers on. And NGOs seems like easy, well, easy take, very, yes, yeah, of exactly, course. Exactly. But then again, this is, the, this is the part where military needs and has to cooperate, and government also, they need to do the monitoring of, of such kind. Uh, we have various NGOs that are very well known internationally and they have their reputation built like Mulch and Cross uh, and, uh, and, and, and various others uh, who you can already trust, you know, their long-standing position, you know, leadership, you know, how their members act and you know how they can 
they can be helpful in any situation. So of course, this is this might be a way to 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 for enemy to insert itself into our safety. But then again, uh, the enemy will look for any and all possibilities. He's doing the same with through the military and through government officials. I guess after your words, I should feel safe. Should I? No, I, I uh, hopefully. I, hopefully I, yes. I hope that you do. Okay, brilliant. Let's move on then. So, okay then, again, coming back to those uh, NGOs, what can be learned from this uh, for future conflicts and what steps should other countries take to ensure effective civilian support in the event of a similar, uh, of a similar conflict? It's all about the preparation in the peacetime. In Lithuania, we already last month, we had a pretty big exercise between military and civilian NGOs. Uh, they were uh, preparing a scenario of evacuation of uh, wounded and uh, disabled people. Uh, it was the first time, it was uh, pretty big exercises. And was it successful? I could not say I was not part of it, but the fact that it's already going on and that we already started to think to think on on these scales and these terms is already somewhat telling, and and we need to continue that, and we need to continue to do that uh, constantly. Uh, it doesn't matter that we are living relatively safe, so to say. We still this is the best time and the only time to prepare and to to start to look four ways of how to how to work better together. Okay, okay. Okay, so again, uh, coming back to your conference. During the conference there was a small presentation on topic about how the West is allowing Russia to beat Ukraine. So what could you say regarding this? I would say that this, uh, it is an oversimplification to say that the West is somehow deliberately try, trying to to give Russia pass in Ukraine. It's it, it all comes down to political will, to fragmented decision making. We simply have too many stops and too many hiccups uh, in, in our process making to, to, to allow for military support, financial support, humanitarian support to flow uninterrupted where, it's, where it needs to go and how it needs to go. Um, then again, as we can say, we already said that we can see European nations are waking up, our support is not wavering, we're trying to do everything we can. We even see potential of uh, rain metal and other Western military... The German factory, uh, that's right. Yeah, mm, mm, weaponry makers trying to open new factories uh, in Ukraine or in nations close to Ukraine, which is a huge step. and. We need to continue on that. Okay. So, okay. Uh, let's let's sum it up. Uh, lessons from war in Ukraine. I know that this was like one of the main, again, late motives of the whole conference. So, firstly, what are they? And secondly, has Europe learned them? And is Europe really going the right way? And are we on time, by the way? Because I We're feel fine. that we are late. Uh, well. Late or not late, it's, there's no other way out just to continue that. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it may be harder for us right now because we have neglected security issues for a long time. And that doesn't matter that we have opportunity to give up right now. We need to, we need to, to simply continue, continue to do what we are doing right now. There's no other way, there's no, no escaping this. Uh, we need to get ready and to, to, to do the best we can to, to find solutions where we need to find solutions, and there's nothing else to say. Okay, so uh, how about next conference? Are you going to uh, are you going to organize oh, another one? Oh, most definitely. We're already getting started with our preparations. Okay then, so I really hope that you will succeed, and I really hope to see you next year at the uh, next Defending Baltics conference. Me too. Thank you. And I would like to remind our viewers that our guest for today was a representative at Locked and Loaded Civic Center for Security and Defense Analysis, Mantas Vilimas. You're watching TVP World. Stay with us.